Cross-site scripting is one of the most common vulnerabilities for any web-based application. So if you're gonna be making one or any websites that are gonna be using JavaScript, you need to make sure that this isn't occurring. Now, before we take a look at cross-site scripting, let's first take a look at the same origin policy where your browser is gonna to try to stop one website from reading or writing data to another site that's in another tab. And it does this by making sure that the protocol, the host, and the port are the same in the origin. So for example, gnu.org, it wouldn't allow reads or writes from Microsoft.com, even though they are both using the same protocol, they're both using HTTPS, but the origin is different, right? This is coming from gnu.org, and this is coming from Microsoft.com. Now, let's say that you are somehow able to control the JavaScript on GNU.org. The JavaScript is able to manipulate the HTML via the DOM APIs, and of course, HTML is the framework for websites. So all of the text, links, pictures, um, and formatting, that's done in HTML. In the background is CSS, which JavaScript can manipulate as well. So with control of the JavaScript, you could do something um, as harmless as just messing up the web page, you know, fill it with some silly memes, or I guess maybe if you wanted to really troll uh, GNU, you would fill it with like Microsoft and different proprietary things. Or you could inject your own JavaScript into the page and have it execute. Um, so over here, we have an example of something that is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So this is just uh, like a simple little search bar like you would see on all different sorts of websites. Um, what it's going to do whenever you put something into it is it's going to send an HTTP request containing whatever you put in here. Um, so like, you know, you search for hats. This isn't really connected to anything, but you know what I mean. If you were on amazon.com and you search for hats, then it would serve you up a different HTML page that's relevant to your search query. So it would show you a bunch of hats that are for sale. Um, but what if I were to send some code instead of just a normal search query? So for example, I'm gonna do this, uh, which is going to make an alert pop up and show this should not happen written inside the alert. And so there you go. And it has some uh, extra stuff too, just because this page was, it's, it's sort of like a little lab, right? It's expecting you to do something like this. Now you're probably thinking that this isn't a very big deal. And in this particular case, just a website that isn't actually connected to anything, uh, there's really nothing important that I can try to pull out of this, right? So that example is called a reflective CSS attack um, because we're just, you know, it's being reflected right here back at us. But this could still be used for some nasty stuff like stealing cookies. Uh, but there's another type of cross-site scripting attack called a stored cross-site scripting attack. So this is where instead of the results of the injection just being sent right back to us immediately. The input actually gets stored on the website in some kind of a database, and it isn't executed until some other end user, or even you, visits that part of a web page or clicks a button that's going to pull some information out of that database. So that obviously gives a hacker a lot more power because they could just store some malicious JavaScript somewhere on a website that they know a person is going to go to later. Uh, maybe it's gonna be like the new product section of Amazon or some other website, uh, or they might have it resting at, in the web page to be executed later. Like maybe they'll put it under winter jackets when it's the middle of the summertime, and then later on they're going to go and execute that once they visit the page. So the most famous example of something like this is probably the Sammy worm. Uh, so this was a uh, cross-site scripting worm that took advantage of a vulnerability that MySpace had back in 2005. Now, luckily, this worm was relatively harmless, like it didn't really do anything too, too bad. Uh, basically, it just updated your bio on uh, MySpace to include at the bottom of it the words Sammy is my hero and then at the, it would be at the end of your bio 
and it would send a friend request to Sammy. <laughs> so, you know, this spread really, really fast because after it modified your bio, the script would then embed itself into your profile page. So there would be some kind of patient zero who first saw this on Sammy's page. Like I, I think he put it into his bio first. And now anybody who's going to that person's page, it executes. And then if you went to that person's page, anyone who's looking at your page now, it's going to execute and so on and so forth. Uh, that's the reason why I think it was like one hour, like this screenshot is from an hour or so after he launched the worm. You can see how many friend requests he has now, so 919,000. And again, this was back in the early days of the internet before a whole lot of people were on it. So yeah, it spread really, really quickly. Um, and since this is JavaScript, it could do anything in the web page. It could have been stealing login credentials. It could have been redirecting people to other websites. Uh, there's really no limit. And there's also a DOM-based cross-site scripting attack, which happens entirely in the client side, and it doesn't necessarily reflect anything back to the victim when they execute it. Um, but that could be done by just sending a sort of like malicious link uh, to the victim so that the client side code runs in an unexpected manner. The page itself doesn't change, so it's not reflected, but the client side code contained in the page is going to execute differently. And there's mutation cross-site scripting where the user input is changed by the browser before inserting it into the DOM, uh, which can sometimes lead to cross-site scripting if it's implemented incorrectly. So yeah, cross-site scripting, it's a very serious problem and you need to take a lot of time when developing your web app to make sure that it isn't vulnerable to this. Uh, that's actually one of the common things that you should be doing whenever you're designing web apps in general is, you know, you take maybe 30% or so of the time to actually develop it, but then the rest of the time you're spending securing it, uh, maybe pen testing it yourself to make sure that there aren't any vulnerabilities in it, or you could hire people to uh, pen test it. It's obviously going to be much better and much cheaper for you. Uh, to figure that type of stuff out before having to like pay lawsuits and stuff to your customers if their data is stolen or if any financial details are stolen from them because of this. Um, so some things that you might want to do is make sure to filter input on an arrival, encode data on output, use appropriate response headers, uh, implement a content security policy. And then, like I said, you want to properly fuzz and pen test your site before deployment. You want to assume that every user that's gonna to go to your website is some kind of a Russian hacker that's going to try to put any malicious thing they can into any text box or comment section anywhere on your web app.